So in the previous lecture, there was a lot, a lot of mathematics. Uh, here we get back to how to actually use C sites. So this is um, uh, repeating the same slide you have seen already at the end of the third lecture, showing what the C site system is in one slide. But now we know a lot more about the part which is saying math or magic is happening. So what we're doing in Seaside is we're picking a bunch of small primes and those are going to be the primes for which we want to compute the isogenies. So we have motivation for picking them small and we're picking them such that four times the product of all those primes minus one is prime. Now that means if we have a super singular curve over this fp, which means it has p plus one points, that means it has actually four times L1 times L2 times rule till Ln points. So if the group order is divisible by i, <clears throat> then we'll know that there are points of those orders because, well, Ls are prime. So there are there is a point of order L1, or there's a whole subgroup of order L1, L means one points of these, and there's the same for all of the other primes. And since an isogeny can be computed as soon as we have a subgroup of the right order, so if you want to compute an L2 isogeny, we need a subgroup of order L2. So here in this case, L2 is 5, so we need a subgroup with 5 elements, so we need to find a point of order 5. And, well, if L2 is one of those allies up there, then we can compute 5 isogenies efficiently. And that's means we can compute, well, we can walk left and right very efficiently. And each of the um, elements that we have in our different Hellman uh, protocol is just represented by one of these curve coefficients. So we have the curve equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus x, and a is the one part which varies. Not all of the a's are possible, not all of them will be curves with p plus one point, but all of the curves with p plus one point that we're interested in can be written in this form. And so we can use this A as Alice's or Bob's key. And so then to compute a positive step in the um, Li isogeny graph, so that means we need to find a point of order Li so that we have the subgroup, and then we can compute with various formulas um, the operation, so the isogeny, and we can also put points through. Now, how do you find a point of order Li? We do know it exists because of the group order. And so we just randomly pick any point. Now that has some order dividing p plus one, so it's four L1 times L2 times move till Ln. And then taking out all the other factors by computing p plus one over Li, we'll either get infinity, well, not very interesting, or we know that the point we're getting has order Li. Because if we compute p plus one times the point, we're definitely getting infinity. And well, if we haven't gotten there yet, the only part that's still missing is this ally. And so we repeat step one until we get something other than infinity. And if your ally is pretty large, well, I mean, you're in a, in a group, but definitely mapping into the group of order ally. So if it's three, then you have a two thirds chance of getting a point other than infinity. If you order 17, you have a 1 over, well, 16 over 17 chance of not getting infinity and so on. So it's always Li minus 1 over Li. So the chance is getting closer and closer to 1, the larger the Li is getting. Now, of course, reduced formulas get more expensive with Li, so we don't want to have super large Li. So well, the step 2 gets more expensive as Li. The first step, well, gets more expensive for smaller Li. And so for a positive step, we find such a point on E. And if you want to do a negative step, then we're going for this quadratic twist that I said. But, well, that means it's, you can either see it as the curve over quadratic extension, or you could say, well, there's the minus y squared, so it's a slightly different curve. Either way, we're getting that the x coordinates over p, so all our arithmetic is carrying a lot of the Montgomery curves, is still using the efficient arithmetic, but we're effectively working over a quadratic extension, just we don't see the y. And so doing a negative step means taking these other points on the wrong curve. And so if you if you watch lecture four, 
then you now know that this is taking um, an ideal class which corresponds to Fabinis having, well, where the, the points have Fabinis being minus, well, corresponding to minus p. Okay, so this is fairly nice for the implementation because everything is just at p. We don't need to worry about extension fields, so it's fairly efficient implement. And if you actually want to look into the details, I highly encourage you to look into uh, the Seaside paper and the many, many, many follow-up papers. For instance, we actually are pushing points through the isogenies. We don't actually finding a point that often we take one point and then doing L1, then L2, and so on. I suppose. For the math details, take a look at talk 4, and if you got scared about talk 4, well, listen to this talk to see why it's useful, and then go back to talk 4. Now, taking a step back, what we have here, I mean, Seaside, of course, is, is great on its own. We have to actually have an example of something which is um, having a commutative group act on a set. And so we call this a commutative group action. And well, of course, we want this to be postponed. That's the topic of this course. And so this is what Seaside is an example. So what we're seeing here, well, I, when I showed the, the graph in talk number three, then I was going like some steps in plus in some color and some steps in minus in some color. But actually, the cycles are compatible. So if you first do well, in the, in the left part, that we're doing a minus in red and we're doing later on a plus in red, those cancel out. So instead of saying, well, we're going minus clockwise and then one counterclockwise in red on the five isogenies, we're actually not doing anything on the five isogenies. And also the three isogenies, we're doing two forward and one backwards, so that just <laughs> zooms down to, to just plus one. And then three minuses in green, those actually stay there. So we have something which looks like z to the power of well, however many isogenies we have. So in our case, we have um, n different isogenies because these l1 to the n primes in the, in the definition of p. And so we have a group action of z to the n. And well, the addition is just plus. So we're having these vectors. So Alice has her vector, Bob has his vector, and their shared key is the sum of the vectors. You also know that this is not a whole story because I mean we're looking at a finite group, and so this is not z to the n will be infinite. So there is actually something more. And at the end of the fourth lecture, I got into this. So what we're actually looking at is the ideal class group of the order of this elliptic curve, so of this endomorphism ring, which is z adjoint square root of minus p. So if we're actually canceling out the trivial actions, then we're getting this finite group there, and there are about square root of p elements in that. But in general, if you have a group action, this is what we're thinking. So we have a group, and we want a commutative group, g, acting on the set s. That means we're taking g times s to s, such that, well, the normal properties hold, so we can like pick two group elements on the same element and be getting composition each way and so on. Now, what we're using in the development key exchange is that we can take two group elements, Alice's A and Bob's B, and no matter which one we operate first, we're landing at the same key. So they both sample a random group element, operate with that group element on the set S, so there is one specific lowercase s which everybody knows, and so that's what they use for their uh, key shares, and then they exchange those, and then both parts get the same. So this always works when you have a commutative group action. So commutative because we need to have VA being equal to AB. But then you might worry, look, this looks extremely similar to what we're used to on elliptic curves or fine field if you have So why don't we have like Shaw's algorithm in it? So seeing this, well, this is just kind of an abstraction of what we always have. The seaside thing looks like a normal if you So when you're looking at how Shaw is working, and so for that, um, go back to the quantum algorithms lectures or the exercise sheets where you found this. Um, the work we actually, or for the um, finding this periodic function, we're actually needing the product of two elements. So there it's a group. Well, there's the integers acting on a group. So this G is actually where the representatives come from. And then we have G times H. But in our case, 
this would be operating on the set like this capital S. And so we need to figure out a composition of the Alice's public key, which is this thing here, and something with Bob's public key, or sorry, the base element and something with Bob's public key. And so we don't know how to combine those. How do you combine two elliptic curves in a way that is, is compatible? So this composition isn't there. While for the, the normal Diffie-Harmon on finite fields, one of the curves, we have these operations. So for seaside or for any commutative group action, which is not actually, well, a group itself, uh, what it operates on, we don't have the problem that Shaw comes in. There are other things. So when you look at the seaside security, um, there are quantum algorithms that come in the bottom of the page, but let's look at what we have as a security. So the core problem, is basically, well, you're seeing the base curve, that's typically this x0, so where the uh, e0, so where the a equals to 0, so just y squared equals x cubed plus 1, and you're seeing the key of Alice or the key of Bob. Now, one thing is, it would be really bad if you could do a brute force key search and just find them, so we need to have enough keys. And I said already on the previous slide that not every a is a valid key, not every A gives a super singular curve, but about square root of P of the A's working. And the correct number is the size of the class group again. So that means we have to choose our P large enough that certainly brute force searches, but also smarter ideas is coming now, won't be possible. And so when you having something of the size square root of P and you can, well, you can do a walk starting from E and from E prime, trying to do a meet in the middle means you're walking for only square root of the size many steps. So that's like in babysit giant step that you know from a normal cryptology course, you're getting a square root speed up. So if the set had, or if the group has square root of p elements, you're getting an extra square root of p, a square root speed up, so you're getting a fourth root of p. So Stephen Dells and Stephen Galbraith have that in the paper from 2016. But if you have a quantum computer, um, then there's actually a paper by Kuberberg which says, well, if you have what is called an abelian hidden shift, and well, anything with a commutative group action is an abelian hidden shift, so abelian is just commutative, then you can actually apply this. Now you might wonder, well, if you look up Seaside, it's from 2018, uh, how can there be a tax on it in 2014? There was actually a predecessor of Seaside which um, was using the same ideas, but was not using super singular curves. So they were having a big problem finding actually nice assertions that they could compute. And for that predecessor, Charles John Sukarev showed how to apply uh, Kuberberg's algorithm. So saying, well, you have to choose your P's so large that a sub-exponential algorithm doesn't do any damage. Um, we like having exponential attacks, but for instance, RSA, with index calculus attacks, uh, sorry, the number field SIF, and if you have find fields with index calculus attacks, we are actually used to having some of this sub-exponential security. So we can scale up our key size to deal with this. Um, and then finally, something which is not the, the math problem, not the core problem, but really like an implementation question, um, can you reuse your keys? Is there any problem? So for instance, for code-based crypto, we had seen the sloppy Alice attacks, for um, the other isogeny based system that will be part of the next lecture, so PSYCH or SIDH, um, those have problems with key validations. And also for lattices, we see that key validation is a problem. Seaside is nice there. We can actually look whether what Alice or Bob sends is a valid key. And all it needs is to check that this is a super singular curve. So verify that this curve actually has p plus one points, and then it's valid. So that's pretty much the same happy situation that we have in the pre-quantum world where with elliptic curves we have to watch out that somebody doesn't feed us invalid points but we have a very efficient way to check this and also for seaside we can just do that. Okay so if you are curious for a concrete instantiation so for the seaside 512 that's named after the size of the prime which actually is 511 bits rather than 512 but we normally take powers of two um, what we have there is that the 
first Li, so L1 till L73, those are the first 73 odd primes. So that's 3, 5, 7, etc. And then searching from there on to the first prime L74, which means which makes this uh, P there B prime. And I realized I forgot a factor of four on the slide. So P is four times this product, the Li minus one. Sorry for that. And then these exponents are chosen between minus five and plus five. So the largest that happens in any direction, so we might either go um, five counterclockwise or five counter, uh, counterclockwise or clockwise. So that means we have, well, 74 places, each of those having a range between minus five and five, so 11 choices that can be squished into 32 bytes if you actually look, in, look into the software. It's much easier to squeeze it into uh, 37, so just 74 half um, bytes, but one could squish it further. And the public keys is just one element of the prime field, so 64 bytes. So if, if P is 512, then A has 512 bits, and that's 64 bytes. It's reasonably fast. This is actually slower than what you might expect from having seen code base speeds, but it's not terrible. I mean, this is something that you won't really notice when you do an execution, but this is not production quality. This is not a constant time implementation. And pre one well, the best we have is a fork root algorithm, so you have a 512 bit primes. This is at least 128 bits. Quantum algorithms, well, there is this um, sub exponential attack due to Cooperberg and, well, then by Charles, John Sukarov, they applied it to, super, uh, to the setting of, of isogenies. And there are since some papers analyzing the security of this or the hardness of this algorithm um, for quantum. We also have one which I didn't list here because this goes into the, the details of how this op uh, thing actually operates. So if you're running Kuberberg's attack, and I understand that I didn't cover Kuberberg's attack, but here's a short summary. So what it's doing is a first um, phase where it's doing lots of oracle calls. What that means is we actually ev evaluate the group action in superposition on curves. And then there is a way of, of combining the results, and that's called civic. Now what the papers that I had on the previous slide analyzed is how long the sieving stage is taking. And also, well, how many of these oracle calls one needs. There are different trade-offs, but most people are just trying to uh, reduce the number of calls and sieving. Um, well, the oracle calls are expensive, um, and the other part has classical and quantum operations, so that's also where normally just the quantum operations are minimized. Okay, comparing the costs is complicated, so we did a paper on the oracle calls, which is like 2 to the 40, but general recommendation is don't use this yet in, in production because it is still not clear how to really, really choose the parameters. So the costs are sub-exponential, but they're definitely super polynomial. And what these attacks are targeting is a little old one, but it's an important parameter of it, so, well, you need to know what it is. And also, as a word of warning, uh, whenever you have a commutative group action, because, well, you want a commutative group action, it's, it's great for functionality, you want it if a Hellman, so you kind of bite into it, but that means you also definitely have a Kuberberg's attack that just comes with the package. 